All right, so we're going to begin. My name is George Brawley. Uh, I'm uh, head of engineering at uh, a little bitty tiny company in southeastern Oklahoma in what used to be the former uh, Indian Territory created by Andrew Jackson. Uh, the little town is the headquarters for the unconquered, unconquerable Chickasaw Nation. Uh, so, uh, you know, if you want to find the place, you know, it's kind of about halfway from Tulsa to Dallas as the crow flies. Uh, please feel free to, to come visit us. So we're going to talk about uh, uh, unleaded aviation gasoline that is a drop-in replacement for 100 low lead. A lot of controversy about that kind of terminology, drop-in, fleet-wide, you can play a, a zillion different uh, word games, but our goal that we put in the original set of requirements, engineering requirements, for this project back in January of 2010 included the requirement that it had to be completely fungible with 100 low lead. You could mix it in any quantity, anytime, any place, anywhere, in the FBO tank, in the wing tank, et cetera. And that carries with it a whole lot of other requirements like material compatibility um, and detonation characteristics and all that other kind of stuff, but, but that's it. Uh, and so uh, we went to work on it and we had the unique advantage of having probably what is the world's finest aircraft piston engine test facility uh, that's sitting on our ramp. just to the left of where that truck is. And so we could build a test batch of fuel and put it in a barrel in the morning and go out and test it that afternoon and know the answer. And if we didn't get the right answer, we could build another one the next morning and rinse, wash, repeat until we found something that worked. Everybody for 20 years before that that had been working on this problem had been trying to find, write a specification for a fuel or find a fuel that fit the existing specification. And our goal was to find a fuel that works and then to write a specification around a fuel that works, which is the way real engineering should be done. And I believe we have succeeded. Uh, this tank that you see right here is sitting on our ramp, uh, courtesy of AvFuel. Uh, and we're, uh, we're in the process of making about 10,000 gallons of uh, of uh, G100 UL there that we're going to use for uh, a whole variety of purposes over the next several months. Okay, so Tim, advance me one, please. So this is actually the control room of that test cell. This is what a mounted engine looks like outside. And I want to go through a short, painful trip down memory lane with you. So go back with me to July 7th. 2010. Cessna's then CEO, now EA President, Jack Pelton, just landed his jet in Ada, uh, along with the president of AOPA then, to observe and investigate rumors about Gammy's new G100 high octane unleaded AVE gas. Click me a button, Timothy. So this Cirrus was flying at the time. It's a turbocharged 8.7 to 1 high compression engine, and it's been off and on flying on G100UL since January 27th, 2010. The second pilot besides myself to ever fly this airplane with that fuel in the wing was some guy named Jim Enhoff. Heard about it, flew his airplane down on a Saturday morning and said, George, God dang it, I want to go fly this thing. So we went flying. Jim could actually fly. Put him in the left seat and he was, he was like flying with a a military fighter pilot, I wasn't going to tell him anything. <laughs> okay, so Tim, click me. So this is a quote from Jack Pelton that he sent out that same day. I'm getting phone calls from pilots who ask about selling their airplanes because they are afraid of the price that their aircraft is going to crater. Now keep in mind the environment. The Obama administration had just come in, the EPA had gotten active, and they were advertising lead studies that were being done all over California. They had conveniently located their, you know, their scientific research lead monitors 
on the chain link fences immediately behind the Cessnas that were doing run-ups at airports and around San Francisco Bay uh, to get a random sample of the yeah. lead quality. <laughs> so, uh, you know, like I say, uh, Jack Pelton sent that out. Uh, it clicked me. At the time when Jack was at Cessna, he owned the 206 and a 195. He actually lived on an air park up at Grand Lake, Oklahoma. Uh, and of course, one of those airplanes was going to be on the ground uh, without uh, high octane unleaded air gas. Uh, click me again. So here's an email that Jack Pelton sent out that same day, that evening, 7.30, 7.27 that evening. Notice some of the language in this thing. It's so, somewhat significant. He s describes it and he says, well, I sat there in that same test stand demonstrating running three types of fuels, an FBO 100 low lead, a minimum spec version of 100 low lead, minimum spec meaning built deliberately to the minimum level of the motor octane number, and a G100 UL. At the conditions we observed, it was very interesting to see the data for three fuels. I would characterize the conditions as worst case sea level test, i.e. excessive manifold pressure, yeah, that 30 inch engine was up at 34, 35 inches of manifold pressure, and excessive heat, you know, CHT is up close to red line. In general terms, the G100 UL outperformed men spec 100 low lead seemed to be about the same as straight from the FBO 100 low lead. G100 UL LL looks to be a fuel that can be refined and distributed within the existing infrastructure we have here in the States. I would guess it could be produced in many other international locations. I know the devil's in the details, you think? <laughs> but this project is very interesting and very exciting. George heard what the EPA said about 100 low lead and is trying to do something about it. Thank you, George, and I encourage all of you to take a look, Jack. Uh, is there a shelf life on that stuff? Pardon? Is there a shelf life? And how no. I mean, we've, we've had it in storage in Florida for three years. It came back identical to when we shipped it to Florida. Advance me one. So, three weeks after Jack Pelton uh, and of uh, Fuller's trip to Ada at Oshkosh, when they made that trip on July seventh, click me. A guy named Click. A guy named Michael Kraft. He was responding to the EPA's recent reports on leaded aviation gasoline. And here's what he said. He stood up, got the microphone in a room full of pilots, said the following. We gotta stop loving the problem and just fix it. Guys, that was 12 years ago. <laughs> 12 years ago. Forward. That was Monday, July 26, I remember. Some of you may have been there, okay? But that's how long we've been loving this problem. Forward. So where are we now? 12 years after he told us to fix the problem. Quick. PAFI. Oh, well, the FAA came along with a classic government industry, taxpayer-funded uh, opportunity to love the problem for a few years. And click me. Started in 2012. How'd that work out? Click me. So by 2018, after about 80 million of your dollars, it was obvious that PAFI had failed. Forward. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't resist, I'm sorry. <laughs> I will tell you that various people from the FAA that were in charge of running PAFI at various different times were assigned to oversee our project. It did not escape Tim Rail and George Brawley that there was a pretty concerted effort to drag their feet because they wanted PAFI to be a success and be it there and get to the finish line earlier. Um, Tim, is that a fair characterization? Okay. So, however, fast forward, July of 2021. How many people were at this event? Okay. So, up on the stage, oh, Jack Pelton, he's been to Ada. Uh, his predecessor, Mark Baker's predecessor, was in Ada. And here's Pete Bunce, the executive director of the General Aviation Manufacturers Association. And then, of course, here's Air One. And it's a good time to talk about this. Air One 
is Earl Lawrence. That's this guy. Underneath Earl, between Earl and the Wichita Aircraft Certification Office, is Air 700, who is a gentleman named Lance Gann. Or at least he was until a week ago. Uh, so it's, you know, this is the chain of command. It goes from Earl Lawrence. He sits in the corner office at 800 Independence Avenue in Washington, D.C. Uh, and these guys are out in Wichita. Uh, his predecessor in that office was Dorinda Baker. Really bright, smart lady who went way out of her way in May of, or in March of 2011, and relieved of his involvement in the project, a malicious actor in the FAA who was trying to interfere and sabotage this project. And uh, I'm not going to go into the gory details, but probably he should have been fired. She asked me what I wanted her to do, and I said, just make sure he never works on our project again, and I'll be happy. She said, well, i got to look at this. I told her, that's fine. She said, well, I'm leaving for New Zealand tomorrow. We were sitting in, in her office, and she, but she said, uh, I'm going to be gone 10 days, but I'll get back to you because I've got to verify all this. So three or four days later, from New Zealand, she calls me, and she says, George, everything you told me turned out to be true. That gentleman's never again going to work on one of your projects. Well, a year later she had to redo that because he kept trying to interfere and work on our project. There has been some malicious interference. I want to stop the, the noise there. Uh, fortunately, this guy in <coughs> July, actually back up, this guy in early July of 2020 met with me and had breakfast with me in Tarkio, Missouri at Sam Graves' hometown, Congressman Sam Graves' hometown. And I went through where we were and I suggested to uh, Mark, you know, we don't know who's going to win this election, but it depends on who wins it, we could have a new EPA administrator next spring. And within six months, 12 months, 18 months, 24 months, we could have a ban on Hunter Lowlid. Do you really want to be president of this organization when that happens and there's no solution out there. He said, so what do you need? And I said, I need somebody to talk to this guy and get him to take a look at our project history and find some people and put it on it that know what they're doing, that are competent, and can get the job done. Two weeks later, Earl calls George on the phone. And I'm going to verbatim his words. George, I've been looking at your certification file. It's taken at least five years too long. There's been way too much high-level regulatory activity and not near enough low-level certification activity. I'm going to take all the people that are currently assigned to your project and I'm going to give them duties to go do nothing someplace else. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to find you three people that actually have some experience doing this stuff, know what they're doing, and I'm going to expect to see conspicuous progress. There's a word for that. It's called leadership. Okay. And I said, Lord Earl, I said, if you put new people on, it's going to take me six or eight weeks just to get them up to speed on the project. I said, you can't imagine how many boxes of documents there are over the last 11 years at that time. He said, George, these are good guys. Go to work. Do it. So a week later, I got a phone call from Wichita, and the guy said, okay, we're your new guys. Three guys. These three guys right here, the manager, the assistant manager, and a project manager. Some of these guys had actually done a previous field STC, uh, the Peterson STC and one of the original EAA STCs. They knew the subject matter. They knew the lay of the land. Okay? And so they said, well, we're going to read your file for a while. And I said, guys, if you want, I said, I'll sit with you and we'll start Zoom calling it. This is the middle of COVID. And I'll, I'll spend two or three days a week and I'll put together PowerPoints and then let's do a Zoom and a briefing. Because I said, this is, you know, this is not a trivial task to, to jump into a bunch of boxes of documents. No, no, we can do that. Okay. Two weeks later, they called me up and said, let's talk about PowerPoints. <laughs> <laughs> so from the 10th of August until about the end of the first week, or maybe the middle, uh, first week in October, about six, eight weeks, every week, we had a scheduled 1 o'clock Zoom on Tuesdays. There was no end date. Sometimes it lasted an hour and a half or two hours. Sometimes it lasted four hours. And I pulled together all the data. 
put it together in an organized fashion, started back at the beginning, and we went through it week by week. And in between, they'd send me questions, ask questions, I pull it together, rinse, wash, and repeat. We did that every week from early August until early October. And then we went to work to do certification work. Now that's the kind of effort that it takes to do a technical review of this project. Kind of focused effort. And I gotta tell you, these three guys, I've never, uh, I mean, if I had to put together a list of six FAA people that are the best FAA engineers and managers I've ever worked with, these three would be on the list. Okay? So, Oshkosh last summer, Earl Lawrence announces the first ever STC for a high octane unleaded APS. Wow. So click forward and rats. It's only for a limited number of airplanes and engines. <coughs> Click me forward. So, during the press conference there, Gamby promised, the, you know, all the pilots and everybody involved in the world, and the press, that we would finish all of the certification and have the approved model lists for the engines and aircraft uh, STCs expanded by when? By next July, end of July 2022. Remember that. Click. So has anything changed? Click. Maybe. <laughs> Click. <laughs> well, it's better than that. <laughs> <laughs> so, walk through this. In December, the last December 2021, some four months after the Oshkosh event, the FAA headquarters ordered the Atlanta Aircraft Certification Office. Now, that's not Wichita. That's, you know, a thousand miles away in Atlanta, an independent certification office to conduct a complete start to finish audit and, quote, independent certification review of the entire G100 UL ABS SDC project. <laughs> Boy, they're in love with this project. <laughs> Fortunately, they put some really good people in Atlanta on this. And they said, look, it's the 18th of December. Uh, we know that this is a high priority, they, you know, in a phone call. So if, if you're available to answer questions and give us documents, we'll change our Christmas leave and put it back in January and we'll work through Christmas. <coughs> and they did. Seven days a week. Every day except the 25th of December and the 1st of January. I was in my office at 8 o'clock on Saturday nights and Sunday nights answering questions and forwarding them documents. Quick forward. But, you know, that was still more evidence of loving the problem and click me again. However, I made, no, normally those cert reviews take months. On January 5th, this document was emailed to Wichita and to this guy, Air 700, from the manager at the Atlanta Aircraft Certification Office branch, ACOB, and it was prepared by a guy named Gary Wessler, who dug all the way, I mean, Gary was having me translate documents from a German chemical, chemical company in German to English so that he could read them. Okay? It's not like he gave this a glance over. Okay? Uh, completed the independent certification review, and here's what's important about it. Based upon this review, our office finds the certification project showings were comprehensive and credible and the proposed amended AML STC is suitable for FAA approval. So we're through loving the problem, right? <laughs> <laughs> Not exactly. So click me forward. Yeah. What was the famous line of Margaret Thatcher to, I guess it was George Bush? Don't go wobbly on me now, George. <laughs> uh, click me forward. And the answer is yes. So two months after the January 5th successful certification review, why did it take two months? Well, on January 5th, that cert review was finished. The Wichita guys, these guys, they sent up a, a, a copy of it 
uh, to uh, Washington uh, and said, hey, here's what it says, we're ready to go. Washington comes back and says, uh, we want you to write an in-depth report of everything that you've done. <laughs> and we're going to give you an outline and we want you to take the outline and respond to each separate Roman numeral one, part A, part subpart B, you know, part, subpart double I, all the way through this 11 page outline well, I found out later where they got the outline. They got the outline from the special certification review that they had used, wait for it, for the 737 max. <laughs> Same outline. So FAA, Wichita, these guys, mostly this guy, but with help from these guys, goes to work, two and a half, three weeks later, he comes up with a 49-page document. It's a complete detailed written description of every single step that's been taken for the last 12 years. Sends it to Washington. They said, well, that's not good enough. I'm gonna love the problems more. We want you to expand a couple of three areas. It goes back. 10 days later, it goes back to Washington. It's now 55 pages long. Uh, if somebody wants to see it, they can come by the booth and I'll pull it up on the computer and let you look at it so you can put eyeballs on it. I can't release that document because it's a quote, internal FAA document. <laughs> So that happened. So they review the 55-page 50, uh, version or the 54-page version of the 49-page version of the discussion of the January 5th certification review. And then two weeks, three weeks later, it goes, or it goes into a black hole for three weeks and the FAA comes out and they've assigned one of their new Eagle members to do a critique of the 54-page document and raise a bunch more questions. You know, it's like having three lovers at one time. Uh, and so then Wichita responds to all those guys responses uh, but apparently that's not good enough so nevertheless on March the 2nd 2022 we're talking 33 days ago or so quick the Wichita Aircraft Certification Office the ICT, ACO, Wichita is, you know, KICT is the airport identifier, ACO, sent an email to GAMI and stated the following. Get your cameras out. <laughs> Quick. Quote, GAMI has completed all, underlined all, necessary showings and findings of compliance and provided type design data and documentation required for the substantiation of the requested uh, expansion of the engine STC with that number. Not most of, or nearly all of, but all. Now, that AML engine STC is in my hand. And it includes, for instance, down on page four, it's 18 pages long, with rows after rows of different make of engines and then multiple model numbers within that. But just to answer your questions, what's the most high powered aircraft piston engine that ever flew in either the military, uh, or maybe the second most ever flew in the military or the airlines? Anybody? Curtis Wright, 3350. And if you go down to row 67, you'll see the Curtis Wright. Uh, actually, it's row 69. You'll see the Curtis Wright 3350. That's on that model list. Every engine in the FAA type certificate database, every engine in the FAA's type, every aircraft spark ignition piston engine in the FAA's type certificate database is on this AML that was the subject of this statement from Wichita. Click me forward. And the very bottom of the email, the following statement. The revised email currently awaits FAA headquarters approval to sign an issue. All right, that was March the 2nd. Click me forward, please, Tim. So then the next day, remember, we've got the engine AML. It's supposed to be in the bag. We're no longer loving that problem, maybe. 
So the next day, we get another email. Click, and click again. And it says, GAMI has completed all necessary showings and findings of compliance and has provided the type design data and documentation required for the substantiation of the request to expansion of the aircraft STC. The AML for this ST will be revised to include those aircraft, remember the first one was the engine STC, this, this is the aircraft STC corresponding, to include those aircraft currently approved for operation on, wait for it, 100 low lead. And lower octane leaded and lower octane unleaded aviation gasolines and mo gas to allow operation on G100 UL high octane unleaded aviation gasoline. By God, are we through loving the problem? <laughs> Click me forward, except for this. <laughs> well, that's pretty damn good news, though, guys. So, forward. Uh, 11 days later, on March the 14th, we get the following email, and it is an email the likes of which I have never before seen come out of a government bureaucracy. Click me. And one more. It's addressed to me. It says, George, 14 Code of Federal Relations, Section 21.21, .21, entitles an applicant to a type certificate for an aircraft or an engine if, click, first, the applicant submits everything to show that the product meets the applicable regs, and, next, the FAA finds that the product meets the applicable regs and that no feature or characteristics make it unsafe. That's what that statute says. But it says if you do this, as a matter of law, the applicant is entitled to the certificate, in this case, the supplemental type certificate. As a matter of law, <coughs> quick. The information above clearly shows the appropriate regs policy guidance has been and continues to be followed by us, quick. Therefore, an immediate approval of the expanded aircraft AML STC is thus warranted. Maybe, maybe we're through loving the problem. <laughs> Click. However, unbeknownst to us and in the background, this guy, Air 700, had been drafting a new document called a work instruction. Never heard of one of those before, but apparently it's a thing inside the FAA. Click. And that work instruction carries this cryptic classic FAA number. It stands for Air 700, that's his office. TAB, T-A-B, whatever that means. And W-1, well W-1 stands for work instruction number one. <coughs> What's T-A-B? Click. Click. Long explanation. Gonna try and shorten it. Here we go. Air 700 Technical Advisory Board, work instruction number one. I didn't know this was going on. This was uh, drafted and signed on the 15th of February. It was approved on the 27th and buried in an FAA routine news announcement. They announced that they had created this project. Now, the history on this is pretty simple. In 2020, Congress passed an act and said for transport category aircraft that weigh up more than 150,000 pounds, we want the FAA to create a special review process, which came to have the name TAB. Well, this work instruction number one that became effective on February 27th decided to apply that same congressional language, which was restricted not only to transport category aircraft, but to transport category aircraft that weighed 150,000 pounds or more to small aircraft. They did this without going to rulemaking. They did this without even publishing it in the Federal Register and asking for comments. They just did it because they could. If any of you have any experience with the Administrative Procedures Act, you probably understand that there may be some questions about that activity. <laughs> so, click me. On March 23rd, remember this is nine days after the March 14th letter, it says you're entitled to the SDCs as a matter of law under our regulations. Got a phone call from this guy, Air 700. Said Gambia was told that the Ave Gas project would again, for the fourth time in 90 days, be put on hold. <clears throat> We're gonna relove this problem one more time. Click. 
and project was going to be the first victim of the FAA's brand new Air 700 tab work instruction number one. So what is a technical advisory board supposed to do? Well, they're supposed to put together a designated number, typically five, seven, subject matter experts, SMEs, subject matter experts, and they're going to review something, something specific, which is created by some kind of a charter. Okay, forward. So maybe we're just back to good old Michael Kraft's observation. Click. So I'm going to put up here a paragraph from the new February 27th work instruction. By the way, they refused to give me a copy of this document when they told us we were going to have to do it. And I said, well, how am I going to know what we're going to do if I don't even get to read the document? Well, maybe we'll change our mind later. Well, eventually, last week ago, Tuesday, they changed their mind. Let me see a copy of it. So here's a, some language from it. Paragraph four, tab decision process. A tab review will be proposed for certain aircraft certification and validation projects. Remember, the congressional language said 150,000 pound aircraft or bigger, but they're ignoring that. And there is no other regulatory authorization from Congress for them to be doing what they're doing. And that one just specifically does not cover what they're doing. This process starts when a project, aircraft certification branch office, or an intake board, well, the Aircraft Certification Branch Office is this place. And an intake board, and I'll talk about that in a second, proposes a tab to this guy. <clears throat> Quick. So proposals for the tab can occur any time during the, wait for it, early phases of a certification project. <clears throat> Note, the Wichita Aircraft Certification Office did not start this process. And guess what? There is no intake board. It doesn't exist. There's not one. Never has been one. But this tab is being started now in March of 2022. The er in the early phases of the certification project, which occurred, you know, 11, 10 years ago in 2009 and 2010, 12 years ago now. So we're going to back up. We're going to violate the explicit language of the work instruction, and we're going to do it anyway. <clears throat> Click. Here's a question. Click. Did the FAA organize and designate a group of subject matter experts back at the beginning of the G100 <clears throat> project to provide the same kinds of review and analysis as this new, now in 2022, tab process is supposed to now provide? Answer? Yes. Question? More than once? Answer? Yes. How many times? Anybody want to take a guess? How many times we've already done this? Quick. Well, we're going to count. Them. Next slide. Tab number one, March 31st, 2010, at the Engine Propeller Directorate in Burlington, Massachusetts. Sitting around the Big Jack Conference room table, there was at least 20 FAA subject matter experts, managers of the EPD, managers from Fort Worth, including the director of the Engine Propeller Directorate, Fran Favera. We're sitting at the table. I still have the PowerPoint. It's a 40-page or 40-side PowerPoint from, from that event. Answered all their questions, la di da di da That was tab number one. Tab number two, uh, three months, four months later, July 2010, this was done down at the Fort Worth Aircraft Certification Office. Most of the people that had been in Burlington, not most of them, half of them, a third of them, came to Ada, or came to Fort Worth, and we spent a day in the basement of that building doing essentially what we had done before here. <coughs> and tab number three, October 5 and 6, same year, 2010, in Ada, Oklahoma, for two days, there were about 10 FAA subject matter engineers, managers, present, including the director, again, Frank Favera flew down from Burlington, Massachusetts, to be there. Uh, the uh, malicious actors that I previously referred to were there in person. Uh, representing <clears throat> the FAA sent their local general counsel from the engine protect propeller director, their friggin' lawyer, to Ada to make sure nobody got off the reservation during the course of that uh, uh, TAB event uh, in Ada on October 5th and 6th. TAB number four, May 18th, 2011, an all-day meeting at, guess where, Washington headquarters, 800 Independence Avenue, corrected, uh, conducted again by Dorinda Baker in her conference room with three FAA subject matter experts and one FAA manager and Dorinda, who was was this person, Air One at the time, were present to basically do the same kind of technical review. 
I have the minutes of the PowerPoints from that meeting. Okay. Number five, February 14th, 2012. We did an all-day event at the Small Airplane Directorate in Kansas City. It was in their large conference room. Every chair at the table was full of FAA people. And the room, the outside of the, of the table against the wall was lined with chairs and every chair was filled with FAA people. There must have been 40 of them in the room. All of them claiming some sort of expertise. Click me forward, number six, January 2014. An all day event at the Fort Worth Aircraft Certification Office with six FAA subject matter experts uh, and managers present. So, we're going to do this again, number seven. And we're not going to do it early in the project, but we're going to do it at the end of the project. What is the work product? What are these guys supposed to do? Well, they're supposed to write a report. Well, what's the report supposed to do? What's well, supposed to, classic, you're going to love this, make recommendations. Heaven help me. So, Michael Kraft, channeling Michael Kraft again. So when will the new FAA tab come to an end and the AMLs be signed? Maybe by, because the work instruction says it will be finished by May the 1st. So maybe by May 1. So in a phone call last Tuesday afternoon at uh, 5 o'clock Washington time that lasted for an hour, when's the last time you saw a bunch of Washington people working overtime? Got a phone call and I was on a phone call with Earl and with Lance uh, and uh, another guy from Air 300. And during the phone call, I asked the question. I said, Earl, is, are we going to be able to get our STCs like the week after this May 1 drop dead deadline? And he says, George, almost certainly. <laughs> Click. And what does that mean? Well, that really only means maybe, doesn't it? Click. So again, maybe we are, in reality, back to Michael Kraft one more time, just to continue loving the problem. Click. Again, this poor old lonely airplane's been flying around an awful long time on G100, unleaded high octane aid gas. So I have to say this in memoriam. Anybody know who the pilot is of this airplane? A guy named John Deacon, rest in peace. Mm -hmm. He's flying out over the Channel Islands in the Bearcat. Questions? Now's the time. Anybody? Yes, sir? Who in the FAA is creating this issue? I mean, to create a new tab and to be pushing this out on a continuing basis, somebody in the FAA is grinding an axe or doing something. Uh, and maybe you can't answer that. <laughs> but, but you can't look at the bureaucracy and be reasonable and think it's okay. Yeah, no, I mean, look, uh, how many people in here have not heard about this newly established EAGLE project? E A G L E. Stands for Eliminate Aviation Gasoline Lead Emissions, EAGLE. The uh, FAA administrator, Mr. Dixon, and the guy that was in the picture at Oshkosh last year on the far right-hand side, uh, Peter Burns, <coughs> did a press conference about four weeks ago announcing the formation of the Eagle Project, which includes a reconstituted, reconstructed, wait for it, PAFI program. <laughs> $80 million wasn't enough of the taxpayer's money. We got to do this again. During the course of that, somebody was asked the question about PAFI, and they said, well, it really wasn't a failure, it was actually a great success because we learned all this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Even though the goal of PAFI stated in 2012 was to replace 100 low lead by 2018. Mm -hmm. So now they're gonna move the goalposts from 2018 to December 2030 oh, with this Eagle initiative. Now, I don't know what the real motivations are to answer your question but I suspect there's some kind of a connection between that event and the events you've seen on the screen. Because it's pretty hard to get Congress to fund a new R&D project to search for a solution to a problem for which the FAA has already approved the solution. Next question, here and then there. 
it, is the elephant in the room here really that the FAA and the industry do not want an SDC proprietary fuel for the fishing fleet, that they really want an ASTM standard? So certainly that plays a large role in what's going on. I mean, Peter Bunce will tell you that that's his motive. Uh, but you got to ask what's motivating him. Who are the people that have a vested interest in there not being a, a, a proprietary specification? Who are the people that are best motivated to want that to not happen? It's the people that are currently making 60 or 80 cents a gallon selling leaded gasoline. And one of those companies that does that has about 50, 55 percent of the market. They've been particularly active in the PAFI project, even held one of the management slots in the PAFI project. And one of them has retired and now holds a key spot in the New Eagle project. So that may have something to do with it. Uh, you know, it's the old thing, follow the money. Okay. Weren't they also located in Oklahoma? No comment. <laughs> <laughs> Next question, Mark. George, you currently have an SDC approval for certain engines. Yes. So, in theory, you're approved by the FAA. Why are we going around back and forth on this just on the expansion? Is there some issue that the original STC was issued in issued error? No, nobody's ever suggested. As a matter of fact, during that phone call last Tuesday afternoon, uh, Earl Lawrence said explicitly, at least twice, maybe more, he said, George, this tab, it's not about your fuel. It's about the process that was used. I said, well, if it's only about the process and not the fuel, why don't we issue the AMLs now? And then you do the process and maybe you'll have some lessons learned. Well, we think we better ought not to do that. It, it, it's that kind of a discussion. Yes, sir? Uh, two questions. One is, how much is this stuff? The don't know the answer to that. You know. What I can tell you is how much it costs us to make it. Okay. okay, and what it's going to cost to make it is going to be somewhere between 50 cents a gallon and 80, maybe 85 cents a gallon more, based on 2018 economics, than what it costs to make a gallon of 100 low weight. And, and I think part of the problem here is a CYA thing. Nobody wants to be responsible if the thing doesn't work. Or it causes problems. Yeah, it's well. Look, the 737 Max fiasco is undoubtedly playing a role uh, in all of this, as witnessed the 11-page outline. The, the outline from the 737 Max Hell uh, that uh, we ended up having to deal with. Yes, ma'am. Say you get all the regulatory approvals tomorrow and everything goes great. They say, sorry for the trouble, here you go. How long until it's scaled up for full scale production and distribution and we're picking it up at airports in the NAS? Don't know the answer to that. If I, if I tried to give you something, it would be at best informed speculation. What I can tell you is, is we are presently engaged in very serious weekly and have been for six months planning discussions with very senior management uh, from one of those large companies whose signs you see going down the street when you need gasoline. Uh, and they're very interested in doing this. And if we get their help, it can happen sooner. If we don't, we've got plan B, plan C, and plan D lined up in place of it. Next question. Again, Mark. George, you made a little bit of a leading question, but in, in your estimation, is, is liability playing any, any part in this? I mean, no offense, you're a small company in three-letter town of Oklahoma versus uh, Phillips and Michelle's and you know, very large companies that have, uh, have a little bank to, uh, to fall on. How does, how does that influence it? Um, well, superficially, it probably plays a role. But if you drill down and look at it, I mean, if Somebody builds a batch of 100 low lead and it doesn't conform and an airplane goes in the dirt. They've got a chain of liability and it's irrespective of the magic ASTM spec. They can't blame it on the spec. All they can do is say this fuel did not conform to the spec and therefore they're potentially liable. Or the fuel got corrupted in the distribution chain in which case, you know, it's World Fuel Services or Avfuel or somebody else that corrupted it in the distribution process. And none of that changes with this stuff. Uh, I will tell you that we have a document, I've got a copy in my roof case, that is approved by the FAA. And the way the paradigm for this works is pretty straightforward. 
Um, let me give you a hypothetical that will maybe illustrate this. Let's suppose that Boeing comes up with a new, very high-performance hydraulic system to go on their next airliner. But it requires a very custom-formulated hydraulic system. So Boeing figures it out, gets a spec for this hydraulic fluid, but Boeing doesn't want to be in the business of manufacturing hydraulic fluid. So Boeing, as the production approval holder for this new airliner, licenses somebody to make the hydraulic fluid according to Boeing's specification. And so somebody makes a hydraulic fluid and sells it to American Airlines in Tulsa to put in Boeing's new airplane when on, on maintenance uh, inspections. Well, we've done exactly the same thing with G100UL. GAMI is the production approval holder using our quality management system. And we can give a refiner or a blender a license that says, here's how you make the fuel, here's the requirements that it has to meet. <coughs> but we've done one thing further, and that is we've decided to use some 21st, actually late 20th century technology, which did not exist in 1935, 1940, when the ASTM spec for 100 low lead was created. And one of the essential requirements is that when the blender gets through making a batch and it conforms to all the standard performance specs that look almost identical to those for 100 low lead, they have to do one thing you do not do for 100 low lead. They have to take a, a, a small jar this big and send it off to an agreed reference laboratory and get a complete chemical analysis done by something called a gas chromatograph flame ionization detection process. And that reference laboratory sends us a copy of the results. We run it through our computer to make sure it conforms to the boundary conditions that we have agreed to with the FAA for the compositional uh, limits on the fuel. If it does, we issue the refiner or the blender essentially a QR code that goes up in the corner of the specification sheet, the certificate of, of authenticity that is handed to the truck driver at the gate of the of the refinery or goes with the rail card papers on the rail card leaving the refinery and then gets copied and handed to the FBOs. So in that instance, if an airplane goes down, the, F the NTSB gets to the scene of the accident and they can salvage 50 milliliters of unburned aid gas and they figure out where it came from. They go back to the FBO, they say, let me see your COA. And when they get it, they either get a number or they get the QR code which they can scan on their phone. They can call us up and say, hey, we need to find out whether this conforms to the fuel that was delivered at the time that it left the refinery. I say, fine, uh, here's the reference laboratory that did it. Send it off to them. Have them send us the results, send you the results, and you can come by and look at the original inspect it. It's in our QA system. So there, and if the fuel's been corrupted, I mean, that's, those tests analyze the composition of the fuel down to sometimes a hundredth of a 1% for each component you know, you know, and when you get to the bottom of it, the other, the undefined, is typically less than 1%. It's about as crystal clear, definitive a process as you could possibly imagine. And it's way better than anything that's done right now. Sales documents, they're there to define a product so that the buyer can pick up the phone and say, send me a product that conforms to this specification or this description and the person that's selling it knows what the buyer really wants and the person that's selling it can sell them a, a, a product with a spec sheet or a certificate of authenticity that meets the request that came from, in this case, the FBO. So uh, that's all an ASTM spec is. It's a commercial document designed to facilitate commerce. It's got no other function. That's its function. We have a specification that does exactly the same thing except it's been enhanced to provide some real quality control of it. All right, I think my time is up. Somebody's telling me to quit. Uh, if, uh, if you'd like to review the AMLs, you can come by our booth and I'll let you look at them. You cannot yet have a copy of them. We also have a press release available here and uh, some frequently asked questions and answers. If you haven't seen those, they are available.